Well, the, the way we're going to do this is we'll just sort of start a conversation here, maybe for about 10 minutes or so, 15, see how it goes, and then open it up to the audience. Um, I'm guessing, Jeff, you've probably done about 100 of these in the last 100 days. <laughs> so anyways, thanks for, thanks for coming out to Hammer and UCLA Natural History Museum and, and doing this. We really appreciate it. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's obviously a, a, a very difficult topic. You, you know, you chase dice, and uh, um, you're obviously chasing coral. And so, um, you know, obviously it's a very emotional picture. And just from your perspective, obviously, you know, you've really tried to focus on filmmaking to really make a huge difference on, on our biggest environmental problem that humanity has ever seen. Um, and it's really tough for, for us to sort of uh, deal with. Um, how do you feel that this has really been um, going for you and really getting the message out and from the standpoint of having the impact that, that yeah. you really desired when you made this career choice? Well, uh, thanks again for having me and thanks uh, for hosting the screening. I'm glad all of you guys can make it and see it on a big screen, which is how it was designed to be seen. So. Um, uh, it's it's amazing having Netflix as a partner for distribution. Um, it's gotten such global coverage. Uh, just our team, the response from our, our social media and to our website and to our email, like it's been beyond overwhelming the the support and response to the film. And and a lot of those messages are uh, are not just the environmental choir. We're getting notes from people who are actively saying this changed my opinion on climate change for the first time. Like I've been a skeptic up until now. There was some person who posted on Twitter and their profile on Twitter self-described as being alt-right and then they were posting about chasing coral and it was like that's exactly who we're looking for. We want, we want to find people who aren't the expected messengers to recognize that this is an issue and to be heralding the story for whatever reasons and whatever values that they, they want to kind of project onto it. Um, and th the fact of the matter is these changes are happening. We, for better or worse, have been out there firsthand seeing them. It's this interesting emotional challenge of going out there into the field to, uh, like, a, to some degree it's a really fun adventure and to some degree it's a devastating, horrible thing that you're witnessing. Um, but it's been, it's been both that privilege and that responsibility to try to capture it in a way that um, you know, we had privileged access to go to places and to meet scientists and to meet experts and to learn what was going on. And our responsibility really was how do we capture that and make it accessible to as many people as possible. And we've been just beyond blown away by the response. In, in other than not getting invited to do a White House screening, which probably would be <laughs> the first thing everybody here not would yet. want. Um, uh, but, you, you know, when you see the numbers it's yeah. the, the, that are in the film, they're so daunting where you basically look at 2050 and um, uh, doing the math and, and looking, at, looking at it, it looks, it looks pretty bleak. And from, yeah. from that standpoint, I know you've, you've had to deal with both of those issues from the standpoint of, mm -hmm. you know, when, you, when you're looking at a glacier and seeing, and seeing the changes there, it's probably not quite as personal um, you know, actually seeing you guys were so emotionally spent in doing all this. And, and so what, what, what gives you the yeah, hope that yeah, we'll no, be able to turn question. around in time? And I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. And um, I think for my own processing, I've pictured what, what does the worst case scenario look like? If we take no action, if we continue the status quo, if we continue to make things worse, what does that worst case scenario look like? And that's a pretty bleak perspective in my mind. And everything that we're doing is one step farther away from that. All the action that we could be doing is, is preventing that. There's not a single tipping point. There are some big tipping points out there, and the oceans are a huge, huge like variable. But in my mind, there's not a single tipping point on climate change. We are already experiencing climate change. It's continuing. It's going to continue to get worse. We've already lost some tipping points. We're going to lose many more. But there are so, so, so many more that we can protect. There are so many more things that are worth fighting for. And in my mind, it's just a matter of where does that boundary line end? Where do we start seeing things turn around? Where does that, do, do our emissions start to plateau? Where do they start to come down? Where does temperature start to plateau and come down? And that's the question. That's what we have control over. And it's not going to be immediate. It's going to be a couple decades out at best. Um, but we're fighting for that boundary line. And so from that perspective, it gives me hope. Like I've already 
we can only keep coral reefs on the planet if we really bust our asses. Like if we really work hard, if we really fight for them. Um, everybody, all the scientists are working on, like it's at this point where we're now considering realistically geoengineering solutions to try to keep corals on the planet. Um, and so how do, we, how do we expedite all the research? How do we expedite the solutions? Um, that's what a lot of our, what our team is working on, what all of our partners are working on, is how do we get this me message out there faster? We, how do we bring more people to the, kind of more, bring more people to the party? How do we get more people celebrating the solutions? Um, and how do we shift that consciousness as soon as possible? So Paul, obviously that's a, a good segue for you. You've been, um, uh, studying coral reef biodiversity probably for 25 years at this point. And um, you've seen a great deal of change. You've seen amazing things in, in the coral triangle. Um, uh, I, I know you've, you've talked about the impacts of pollution and overfishing and, and, and the like. Um, with everything that you've seen over the, over the years, um, uh, how are things specifically in the areas that you've been focusing um, within the coral triangle, are you seeing some areas that are a lot more resilient? And like, what are the factors that, that sort of give you, give you hope for, um, for those areas in particular? Yeah, so, um, you know, working in, I've been working in Indonesia for, for quite some time. And, uh, you know, one of the interesting things that you see out there is that there are areas that do seem to be more susceptible to bleaching in areas that uh, seem to be a little more resistant. And uh, there's even places in um, Indonesia where on a daily basis the uh, waters that these corals are living in can top 39, 40 degrees centigrade. Um, it doesn't, what's that? Uh, 102, 103 degree Fahrenheit. So. Um, you know, uh, a almost uncomfortably hot hot tub. And, uh, you know, they can do it for short periods of time, but they do it. And they do it on a regular basis. And uh, in areas, um, there are areas of Indonesia that even during these large global events, some areas bleached a lot, some areas didn't bleach as much. And, and I think that, um, and there's people in my lab and there's people elsewhere who are interested in understanding, you know, what is it that makes these areas resistant? Is it the variance of the microalgae that lives inside the coral tissue? Uh, there's some thoughts that uh, perhaps there's uh, genetic variation in the corals that's adapted to these higher temperatures. Uh, much like we're finding out with people, the, the microbes that uh, are associated with the corals uh, maybe playing a role as well. And so I think that's uh, an important part of understanding uh, the resilience is trying to figure out, you know, studying these unique places that, that do seem to bounce back, that do seem to be protected and understanding why. And is there something that we can take from that knowledge and use to help places that are more susceptible? So in, in what you've seen on the thermotolerance in, in corals and other researchers have seen in, in various other different places, um, is do you see uh, this sort of um, response in a wide variety of different species? Um, are, there, are there some coral species that are just, you just don't see um, uh, much thermotolerance and so they're, they're in really much worse shape from the standpoint of being able to ride this out? Um, how does that sort of look um, for people who, you know, I'm sure a lot of people out here are, are divers and have, have gone to a lot of different places. Um, which, which sorts of corals do you feel are most vulnerable and which ones aren't um, and what you've seen so far? So at least in the, the work that students at my lab have done, uh, the Acropora seem to be particularly vulnerable. Um, and things like parietes, these big massive corals, uh, tend to be less susceptible to bleaching. Uh, I don't know whether you know, it's something that has evolved over time uh, or whether you know, it has to do with, uh, you know, they talked about the, the tissue depth in the, pr uh, in the parietes being you know, half a centimeter. There's much more tissue there than uh, in an acropora. So they may have more uh, 
reserves to draw on because uh, the microalgae that, that photosynthesize inside the coral tissue, it's providing 90% of the nutrition to the coral. And so, you know, really the issue uh, isn't so much that the corals themselves get too warm, it's, it's just they starve to death. And so I, I think that some of these massive corals that have uh, thicker tissue may have more nutritional reserves to draw on, and that may contribute somewhat to them being able to withstand hotter temperatures and potentially for longer periods of time. We, we can confirm everything you just said based on our time lapses. Um, all, all, the, all of the corals that have those branching structures that look like tree branches, those are always the first ones to bleach. And uh, the parietes and, and some of the more boulder-like um, corals, those, we, so those were the, always the last ones. Um, those were always the slowest to bleach. And the ones that we didn't even intend to document, it was sort of like, oh, that, it ended up in a, one of the shots. And then we saw afterwards just how bad it got. But um, yeah, absolutely. So Jeff, I, you know, and having spoken to you before, uh, you talked about, you know, making this decision of making, making documentaries to really make a difference on an issue that that just means so much to you. And um, and and one of the things that really struck me was that uh, it wasn't just for the documentary; it was what happened after the documentary, yeah. and really what what you were doing to really impact the issue. And can you share a little bit with the audience yeah. what you've been doing and, and what you think's going well and what yeah. isn't going so well, since it's, it's a pretty bold endeavor? Yeah, um, when, when we first made Chasing Ice, um, the intention wasn't to go out and change the world with the film. We were really just trying to show James Baylog's story. Um, our team had gone and done time lapses of glaciers. We had what we considered visual evidence of climate change, and we wanted to get that story out there. And um, every screening that we went to, people were telling us that it changed their perspective, and people were telling us that it had a huge impact on them. And then everybody kept asking, what can I do? And we, for years, we were stuck with this question, what can I do? And like, oh, I, I don't know, I don't know you, Who, what can you do? Um, <laughs> and uh, wh what can, I've had this issue now with that question, what can I do? Because it implies that a single person can solve climate change. It's like we, one person can't do this alone. We all need to be working on this together. We all need to be thinking really, really big about how we shift um, really the, the political system in this country. We, we can solve this so easily with one tax for one, one emission, one piece of pollution. We can tax that and solve this problem in, a, in the snap of a finger um, and let the free market solve it based on what's incentivized and what's not incentivized. But we're far, far from getting to that point right now. So in my mind, the, the next best bet is to shift the mindset to get to that place. So with Chasing Ice, we were wanting to really push the film out there in a big way to get to audiences, to have that conversation, to see what's going on, to see what people are thinking. Um, and we have really focused on an impact campaign. Um, and we used Chasing Ice for a big impact campaign, and now we're developing an equally um, ambitious campaign with Chasing Coral all around the question of can we move a community on climate change and wanting to um, screen the film in conservative parts of the country where audiences might not be as, as amenable to a climate message or to climate solutions. And within those communities, find people who are unexpected messengers and help them share their stories and put their stories out there about why they care and why they think this is an important issue. And in many ways, just sort of trying to get out of the way ourselves um, and looking for the local heroes and the local champions. So that's some of the work that our team is working on right now. Um, it ties in with doing screenings of the film and then finding additional stories for us to capture within the local community. Um, and we're building a whole vision for how can we leverage change in that fashion. So you've been doing it for a few months now. Any, any early returns? Um, uh, a good number of immediate pieces of feedback. I mean, it's it's one of those things where the more time we spend in one community, the more deeply invested we get. Um, really, our, our perspective is if we screen the film 100 times all across the country, we normally get the environmental choir, at least the majority of those audiences are the environmental choir. If we screen 100 times in one community, 
we can get farther beyond that. And because of the word of mouth effects, because of people telling their friends, come and see the film, oh, I'll host it, oh, come on over and let's watch this film this weekend, um, that's where we're really finding that we're getting out to more and more audiences. Um, so right now we've been focusing on one community in the southeast, um, and through some specific partnerships we have there, a lot of opportunities have come up to screen in churches and in schools and in lots of community groups. Um, but the response has been continuously, like people are telling us that the film has had an impact on the way they see the issue. Um, I think that's, from my perspective, the most valuable thing here. Despite what you might think of global warming and climate change, despite what you might presuppose about glaciers melting or sea level rise or wildfires or droughts or hurricanes, any of those other natural disasters, this is a story of, a, of an environmental catastrophe that's happening that people haven't usually seen before. It's the first time it's ever, it, it's gotten this big and this bad, and it, it portends the, the destruction of an entire ecosystem. Like th we're talking about a very, very different level of change than any of those other factors that have some sense of a natural cycle to them, even though that cycle's changing really rapidly. This is a totally new visual story, and so I think that's been one of the, the, the strengths of this film. So you, you've chased ice, you've uh, chased coral, but it seems like, you know, obviously this endeavor is not a, a, a quick turnaround, um, but just out of curiosity, are you... Chasing Congress? Uh, no. Chasing Congress. <laughs> So so, not so, so it's not wetlands, it's not rivers, no, it's I'm not so, rainforests. I don't want to document it's not another sanity. dying <laughs> ecosystem. Chasing sanity sounds good. Chasing <laughs> chasing sleep and rest sounds good too. Um, yeah. it, you know, these changes are devastating changes happening to our planet. And at this stage, I'd much rather us focus on the solutions how to, and how to use these existing tools um, for the change that we need rather than continue to document the demise of these ecosystems. Right. Um, there are countless more films that can and should and need to be made. Um, and I think personally, you know, it's been 10 years working on this kind of stuff now. Um, and, and, and watching these ecosystems get destroyed is not exactly uplifting. Um, but but we have the tools now, we have the visual evidence, and in my mind, hopefully, this is all we need, that we don't need more more visual stories of this to get the point across, so that, so, that's my own personal So hope. chasing humanity is pretty much what's next. Okay, yeah. um, and, and Paul, um, you've been at it for a long time, obviously you've seen a, a lot of pretty devastating impacts in some pretty extraordinary places. What sort of keeps you going, um, and, uh, and 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 how do you sort of keep that enthusiasm? And you might want to even talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of your work with, uh, uh, you know, students that aren't <coughs> even exposed to these sorts of issues, and really trying to change their lives through exposing them to what's happening there. Yeah, um, you know, it can be hard at times, <laughs> um, and I. I haven't seen this as many as many times as you, but ever, like, you know, I've seen it several times, and it's just as difficult to watch every time. I can't imagine having to have edited this and, and watch it hundreds of times. But um, you know, I, I, I think the thing to, that you know keeps a lot of us going is that I mean, you you, you have two choices. You you can you can keep going, or you can give up. Um, and uh, giving up really... Or you can just study it, which you know a lot of your colleagues choose to do. Well, but, you know, it's... I, I, I think that in some ways that's, that's part of the issue. Um, you know, I think uh, Richard hit on a very good point early on, that, that this, is, this is a marketing problem, and that people aren't aware of the issue, and... Um, not only are they not aware of the issue of, of the ecosystems, but um, they're not necessarily aware of, you know, it's, it's not just the devastation of the ecosystem, it's what's going to happen in the societies that depend on those ecosystems. <coughs> so, you know, I, I work in, in Indonesia, and Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world. It's 240 million people. And you know, when I was in high school, there was this uh, global charity concert called Live Aid to provide uh, resources to 
people starving in Somalia and Ethiopia because they had degraded their ecosystem to the point where it couldn't sustain them anymore. And you know, after that, you know, we saw the same thing happen in Haiti when they degraded their ecosystem to the point where it couldn't sustain themselves anymore. You know, you look at what's going on in Syria right now. You know, this is this is the civil war that that's there is, is a function of uh, multiple years of of drought and failed crops and people fighting over scarce resources who have nothing left to lose. And something like that happens in a place like Indonesia with 240 million people. Like, that's a global game changer. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, th I think that that's, that's one of the things that, that, that keeps me doing this, is that, you know, if, if we don't get the message out, if people aren't, people who don't get a chance to, to go and spend time in these amazing places that don't get to spend the time underwater, that don't get to meet the people, um, you know, they have to realize that this is happening and that, you know, it's not about, it's not about coral reefs necessarily. I mean, I, I, don't get me wrong, it's like I want coral reefs to be here for a very long time, but, you know, ultimately, if we make this coral reefs or people, people are always gonna choose people. That's, that's just what we do. Um, but it's not coral reefs or people, it's coral reefs and people, or it's no coral reefs and really, really big global social political problems. And if, I mean, that's why we have to keep doing this because if not, like the entire world's gonna suffer. Just to add a thought to that, I completely agree with everything you just said. Um, I, I was talking with a friend once, and um, we were saying goodbye, and, and my friend made a comment about how he was glad for the work that you know our team is doing for the environment. And I, the way he said it, I was like, oh, I'm not doing this for the environment. Like, I don't care about <laughs> the environment. I care about human civilization. Like, humans are going to suffer massively if these ecosystems aren't there that we depend on. And it was this weird little light bulb moment of of just a mismatched expectation there. Like, Syria, as you mentioned, um, all the, the it's half a billion to a billion people that depend on coral reefs for their main source of protein. Like, that's a huge food crisis if you've got nearly a billion people that are malnourished because their main source of protein has now disappeared. Um, and all of the domino effects of all of these natural catastrophes, of, uh, catastrophes that we're talking about, um, climate refugees is going to be one of the biggest problems of the century um, as people are struggling. You only need one bad storm to bring salt water into your cropland and that cropland is useless. And it, you don't need sea level to rise and be a permanent change. You just need one extreme storm to wipe it out. Look at Puerto Rico, look at the Caribbean. Like th this is what we're going to be dealing with in the decades to come. And it, it doesn't stop immediately. Like these are long-term, the, the inertia in the system is there. So even if we stopped emissions today, there's inertia in the system, which is why it's as urgent as possible as we cut the emissions as fast as possible. That said, yeah, I'm still and, hopeful. Like, <laughs> despite yeah. all of this, like I am still hopeful, th and the solutions are coming. The technology is there. In my mind, there is this, this downward trajectory of the state of the planet, and there's rap there's a rapidly growing exponential rise in the solutions and the technology. And the question is, when do those two cross each other? And we need to be expediting the technology faster and faster. There are electric planes coming out and hitting the market. Right now they're small, they're like for, for pilot school, but NASA and Boeing have developed hybrid planes, they're developing fuel cell powered planes. Like we will be flying carbon free at one point. Um, hopefully sooner rather than later. Like we're seeing these massive, massive shifts in all of our systems. And that, that's the thing that gives me the most hope is that we can figure out a way out of this. Yeah, and, and if you look at sort of the history on environmental success stories, I mean really tying it to how it impacts people um, has always been the, the big secret to success on all those efforts. Um, with that, um, why don't we open it up, although I can't see anybody <laughs> because yeah. we're blinded yes. up here. Um, uh, why don't we open it up to some questions? Right there on the aisle, your hand was up first, I think, yeah. Okay. Uh, can we bring up? Please wait for the mic to, ans to ask your questions. There's a mic somewhere? Uh -huh. Yeah, somewhere. Can we breed a heat-resistant coral? And 
are artificial reefs, is that a viable project if it's managed correctly? Uh, can we breed heat resistant corals? I, I suspect that we can. Um, can we use that as a way to solve uh, this issue? Uh, there's a significant scaling issue. So if you think, I mean, this movie focused on the Great Barrier Reef, um, which is the second largest coral reef ecosystem on the planet. Uh, Indonesia is actually larger. But if you look at all the coral reef area in the Great Barrier Reef, it's about four times the size of Los Angeles County, but spread over an area about the size of California. If you look at Indonesia, it's again about a little over four, so four times the, the area of Los Angeles County, but spread over an area that's four times the size of California. And so you can breed these corals, and, and people are doing it. Ruth is doing it uh, with, with some of her colleagues. And you know, I suspect that it will be successful. Um, but how do you scale that up to you know, the size of uh, the entire state of California? And that's where the, the real challenge become, uh, comes in. And, and maintain biodiversity and... and yeah, exactly. So, you know, can we, uh, can we do this for all 340 species of coral on the Great Barrier Reef? I don't know. There's twice as many coral species in Indonesia as uh, the Great Barrier Reef. Can we do it for all of those? Uh, all of the symbioses that depend on those individual coral species. Um, it's, 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 you know, I think it's a, it's a worthy exercise. Um, and we'll learn a lot by doing it. And, um, but actually implementing that it, it, on a large scale becomes a really daunting task. Which would be a really awesome project for a young engineer, <laughs> if there's anybody out here. <laughs> um, yeah, next question uh, in the front. In the middle. Oh. <clears throat> Um, first, I just want to say thank you for all three of you for coming out to spread awareness of the issue and uh, everyone in the audience uh, who's eager to learn more about this. Um, my question is tethered specifically towards Jeff, and I'm just wondering if you could talk more about the future of storytelling through film and, and the technology that um, you were able to utilize making this film and chasing ice with the underwater cameras and time lapses and it looked like virtual reality glasses that you're sh you know, spreading to schools and how the future of, the, of that might look in storytelling. Like for example, are we gonna be able to see time lapses of, of images of the earth from space? I know there's remote, remote sensing and stuff, but is that possible? And, and how, how, do we need a, how do we need to integrate this into you know, elementary schools to, to, so that they can get out there and explore these things that it can be very difficult for them to have access to? Thank yeah, um, that's an interesting and somewhat broad question. I'm trying to think how to how to refine that. Um, uh, films, I think, are always going to be here. If this is, we are storytellers um, as a human species. I actually think less that we are storytellers, but we are all story listeners. Like, all, not everybody's a good storyteller, but everybody can listen and identify a good story. And there's something that, like, when there's a good story being told, we all are hooked on it. Um, so. There are all these different mediums out there, um, and uh, mentioning VR um, and where AR is going and virtual reality is going, uh, I don't think by any means it's a replacement for film. Uh, I think it is just another medium, just like you have radio and you have podcasts and you have television, you have film, and virtual reality is a different tool. It's similar to filmmaking in its time and its editing and its cinematography generally, um, but it's a completely different beast. I think we're gonna see very, very big changes in terms of virtual reality and also shared experiences within virtual reality, um, both from a 360 degree video perspective, but then also room scale experiences where multiple people, multiple people can stand in the same room and walk around and move around. Like you actually could go like virtually diving on a reef and move forward and backward and see different sides of a reef using existing technology already. Um, so th those are just exciting things in terms of seeing where that's going. 
Um, what Zach is showing at the end of the film with the Google Cardboard headsets, um, that is a project um, that Google put together called Google Expeditions. And they have a bunch of different ecosystems and, and expeditions within their platform, but it's a system that's designed for use in the classroom. Um, so we have uh, one or two kits and we send Zach out to a bunch of different places uh, to do these expeditions and you can get them directly from Google as well, but it's designed where there's a tablet that a teacher can use at the front of the classroom and all of the students get um, you know multiple device everybody's got their own device and the teacher can click on the shark photo and then all the headsets switch to the shark image at the same time and the teacher has a lesson plan and notes built in about what to talk about and and the teacher can see where the students are looking on the screen and what they're interested in or where their attention is um, and the teacher can switch to a different image and you can have audio playing through it and it's it's an immersive experience um, and it's also a shared experience where everybody in the room can have that at the same time. Um, along those lines, if, if you wanted to host a screening of Chasing Coral for a school or a community group or anywhere, like you can just go to chasingcoral.com and you can sign up for a screening. You can host a screening in your home if you know a skeptic or somebody or just a friend that you want to share the film with. Um, just go to chasingcoral.com and, and we can send you info and details. Um, in some cases, we can send uh, members of the team out or get somebody there for a Q&A. Um, all of that's available and, and uh, on the website and it doesn't cost anything. All you need is uh, just a network. Netflix login from anybody uh, to be able to, to play the film. But we're really wanting to support getting it out there and we're really, really focused on schools and education and getting it to as many schools as possible. So by all means, if you have any, any leads there, please uh, set up a screening. Yeah, well, and it's definitely consistent with California's ninth and 10th grade life science curricula. So I mean, just getting that embedded there would be great. All right, I can't see anyone in the back. Oh, well, there we um, go. I have a, I have a the question. The person who I thought I was pointing Where to at the first yeah. first Thank time. you. Um, yeah. This is a very impactful movie, but we are your target audience. This is, you know, I think a more enlightened group, and we already believe uh, what's happening with climate change. But, you know, part of it uh, focused on the Barrier Reef. The Australian government yeah. um, is very sceptical that yeah. there is anything um, going on in terms of climate change. Plus... The Queensland government is already dredging part of the reef um, for a deep, um, a deep sea port so that they can export coal. How do you actually impact governments? I mean, we are individuals, but governments who, you know, you can't get on board, whether it's the US or Australia, I mean, how are you trying to involve them, what can we do as individuals? I don't think anybody has the answer to that question. Um, it's, a, it's a challenging question. Um, we think about that all the time and we're building a team to focus just on that. Um, it's, it's piecemeal, it's step by step. Uh, we've been consulting with great lobbyists, with great advisors, with people who work in the political world. Um, and everybody's just looking for little ways that you can have influence here and there. Um, we've been focusing our campaign on the United States more so than Australia. Um, there's equally as much to do in Australia. Uh, one of the challenges in Australia is that, it, one of the fascinating things that, uh, that we found was that even the tourism industry, who their entire livelihood is based on the health of the Great Barrier Reef, even the Australian tourism industry has downplayed how bad this issue is. And it seems like they're more motivated about short-term financial interests than the sustainability of the thing that they are like selling access to. And that's sort of just a mind-blowing notion. Sorry, you're a lot younger than I am. I spent 20 years, 25 years on that exact issue where the coastal tourism industry was in denial on coastal pollution. And so, um, yeah, you'd have people swimming basically in raw sewage, um, but, you know, unknowing populace and customers seems to be very short-term thinking, to say the least, that's for sure. There are videos that I've seen that the Australian Tourism Board has put out where they're asking random tourists about their experience on the reef. And, and the video is showcased, it came out like during the peak of bleaching, and the, the video was show, wanting to showcase it, look, look at how good it is, and the tourists are having a great experience. And... And for the most part, not to, I mean, 
it's a terrible premise. You're, you're asking just random people about a professional opinion of what the reefs look like. Probably but first time ever first on a time reef. First time ever yeah. on a reef. And the responses were, oh, it's so pretty and beautiful. And, oh, I saw a turtle. And, oh, like, they're so bright and colorful. And some of that was, like, <laughs> they're looking at bleached and fluorescing corals thinking that this is healthy and good. And, like, oh, just painful. <laughs> Sorry, this is I, I know. we can open this opening of a floodgate. Who's got a more optimistic here. question yeah. for us in the back? Anybody? If you have more ideas on the subject, please by all means share them or throw yeah, them no, out that, there. Yeah, no, that's a yeah. that's a separate panel to be sure, if not ten of them. Yeah, over there. Um, sort of two thirds of the way up, two seats in, hand up, wearing I think gray. Uh, he's, he's, he's got a he's mic. Got a microphone. <laughs> oh. He's got a mic. Maybe we can pass the next mic to the next person. Could I ask a qu quick question? Oh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, question I have is, it was mentioned in the film that you have something equivalent to a seed bank uh, yeah. that you're going to do with coral. Where so is that being done, and is it in a central location? So um, it's, it's referenced in the end credits, um, what Richard and his team are working on. Um, it's a project called 50 Reefs, uh, and there are a handful of scientific advisors working with Richard on this. The idea is to come up with a global plan uh, around which reefs around the world are the most likely to survive the warming over the next couple decades. So they're trying to make a projection around given known um, temperature estimates, which areas do we think are the most likely to survive the brunt of it? And then with that knowledge, identifying those 50 most viable reefs, then put all the resources into saving and protecting them um, and eliminating all of the other stressors. So agricultural runoff's a huge stressor, uh, overfishing is a huge stressor. There are places where people dynamite reefs because it's the easiest way to catch fish and they're literally just destroying the corals for the short term benefit of like, oh, just skimming the fish off the top. Um, so identifying those areas, protecting the hell out of them and then hoping that those places can be the seed, bank, seed banks that then can reseed the oceans. And, and one thing that's critical there that we, we don't, we show a little bit of footage, but we don't really highlight it much, is what coral spawning is. So in that scene, um, it's a dark nighttime scene, and you, look, you see the corals, and these little bubbles start popping out of the coral, and they come out, and they are then floating in the water. And those bubbles, that's all the coral sex going on right there. That's the sperm and gametes and egg just floating around and you smell really funky after a dive and that stuff. But it's, it's the process of corals reproducing. It's, it's mind-boggling. They know exactly when the coral, like this species in this part of the planet is gonna, is gonna spawn on this day and the full moon at this time. And literally, we were, we were getting ready to film that dive, to go on that dive, and um, we were in uh, uh, flower gardens uh, in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Texas, and, and the scientists who we were with, uh, Emma, looked at our watch and she's like, no, wait, let's wait a little bit longer. And okay, we can get ready to go in and all right, time to jump in the water. And we go in the water, we're down there, everybody's getting settled and a couple minutes in, all of the corals just started just releasing <laughs> at the same time. And it was, it was such a magical thing. And, and one of the, the most hopeful things about that is it is mass spawning. This is just millions and millions and millions of reproductive opportunities floating downstream. And if the conditions are right downstream, that little cell can latch on and a new coral can be born. And if we keep those conditions right, nature can solve itself. Nature can fix itself if only the circumstances are right. Um, corals can't adopt fast enough. They can't evolve fast enough for these conditions. They can't migrate fast enough for these conditions. But we can, we can change the parameters to allow the conditions to still be successful for the corals. I, I was just curious related to that, Paul. Have you heard of, of any researchers sort of documenting any sort of uh, edge effects um, from the standpoint of maybe um, uh, the, the northern or southernmost ranges of various different corals and, and, and whether they're seeing any potentially any beneficial impacts or is this all occurring so fast that all we're really seeing is, is detrimental? It's, it's, it's happening very quickly and it's happening over really broad areas. Um, and, you know, the, the corals that live near the edges, they're, they're at the edges because they're already at one end of their environmental tolerance. And so um, 
those, I mean, those are uniquely stressful environments to begin with. Um, so I think that this is something that we'll start understanding a little bit more. Um, but I, I did want to just follow up on something that, that, that Jeff said, which is um, these, these ecosystems are actually pretty resilient. And, and if we stop screwing them up, they actually come back. And uh, you know, uh, we've been doing a lot of work recently in a place called Marea, which is part of uh, French Polynesia. And you know, in the early 2000s, there was a massive outbreak of this uh, sea star that, that eats corals. And it just mowed down the reefs. Uh, and that was followed by a massive typhoon. And so they went from like, you know, 100% coral cover to, to basically barren. And you know, here we are you know, 13, 14 years later, and it's back at 100% coral cover. And I mean, it's one of the oddest reefs you'll ever see because every coral is exactly the same age. But as long as, as, long as there are sources uh, of, of larvae, as long as there's some healthy coral ecosystem out there that's reproducing, they'll take care of themselves. And, and I think that um, you know, more than thinking about those sort of technological solutions, if we can figure out that, if we can focus our technology not unnecessarily reseeding the ocean with corals, but figuring out how to mitigate the um, environmental impacts that we're having on those ecosystems, you know, the, if you look at the maps of the Great Barrier Reef that bleached, the areas with the heaviest bleaching were the ones that are closest to land. Those are the ones that are being impacted by agricultural runoff, by sediment from those agricultural activities. The ones that are further offshore didn't bleach as bad and didn't have the same sort of levels of mortality. So I mean, just being able to uh, control some of that agricultural runoff and, and remove some of the nutrients that we're putting into those systems. And, and, and those are actually not difficult technological solutions. It, it may cost a little more um, for our produce, but, but it's something that we can do pretty easily. <coughs> Th thanks, Paul. And I, I just, in light of the time, I just really wanted to um, you know, thank you both, Paul and Jeff, for um, uh, spending your evening with us today, and Jeff for um, showing us your spectacular film and being here to talk to us uh, about it. So let's give, uh, give them a round of applause. Thank you, everybody.